Don't wait until the last minute to register your child for the next school year. We'll help you start the process. Hello, I'm Audrey Williams and welcome to Jamaica Magazine. In today's show, we also tell you of government's commitment to ensuring learning takes place among deaf students. And we'll take you down memory lane with some classic festival songs of the 60s and 70s. Please stay with us. The government has big plans for St. Thomas as it continues to drive economic growth and job creation. The Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation invites you to the Hope for Jamaica Town Hall meeting with Prime Minister the Most Honorable Andrew Holness on Thursday, July 13 at 6 p.m. at the Goodyear Oval in St. Thomas. Come and hear the government's plan for the economy as we build a prosperous Jamaica. That's the Hope for Jamaica Prime Minister's Town Hall in St. Thomas. Thursday, July 13 at 6 p.m. Taking government to you. Brought to you by the Minister of Economic Growth and Job Creation. Building a prosperous Jamaica. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your GIS News for Thursday, July 13. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says his administration is in full support of the development of local marijuana-infused products, but the necessary procedures must be followed. He made the statement yesterday as he addressed a function held to announce a major breakthrough for a locally developed drug to treat acute myeloid leukemia. Cresserol, which contains cannabis, has been granted orphan drug designation by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA. It was developed by Jamaican scientist Dr. Henry Lowe and a team of researchers based in the United States. The Prime Minister commended Dr. Lowe and the team, adding that government was implementing the necessary regulations to support scientific innovation. And what is of importance is that the government of Jamaica has to ensure that it meets all the international standards that we are compliant, the plant, my cannabis, and the drugs that could potentially come from it, um, in many countries are still not recognized, and some countries still consider it illegal. St. Anne is closer to witnessing the establishment of a Craft Development Institute, CDI. The Tourism Product Development Company, Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts, and Ziacom Limited signed a contract on Tuesday for the completion of the business case plan. Ziacom is expected to produce the plan at the end of three months, while Edna Manley College will provide training to those who will be benefiting directly from the institute. In addition to training, the CDI will also provide certification, support the development of authentic Jamaican craft, and protect new designs. It will form the basis of entrepreneurship and to provide the framework for more jobs to be created and for more income to be derived and consequently a greater hope for prosperity. The facility is scheduled to open in September 2018. 133 textbooks from the Ministry of Education's approved 2017-2018 supplementary list will be surveyed by the Consumer Affairs Commission, CAC, ahead of the new school year. The exercise, which is a partnership with the Education Ministry, will be undertaken during the final week of July and the results made available by the second week of August. This annual exercise is being carried out in order to provide parents and guardians with timely information on prices and availability, which will guide book purchasing decisions. Parents and guardians may use the Commission's price inquiry tool, incidentally, which is on our website, which you can use to make informed decisions before you make a purchase. The Rural Agricultural Development Authority, RADA, and the University of Technology have signed a Memorandum of Understanding to develop a Master's of Science degree in Integrated Rural Development. The program is slated to begin August 2018. This MOU provides broad terms for RADA to support UTEC with not only the development of the program, but also in providing internship opportunities for students. It will also allow for the provision of training for RADA staff in critical areas related to rural development. 
CEO of RADA, Peter Thompson, says this is a strategic partnership which will benefit rural Jamaica and its environs. When universities partner with industry, great things can happen. And we expect that out of this, there will be solutions, practical solutions that will be able to address some of the issues that we have out there in the communities. UTEC President Professor Stephen Bassiani also welcomed the partnership. We are committed to the objectives of the partnership, which include, among other things, developing community rural development specialists, increasing knowledge and technical skills of citizens working in rural development, and promoting rural entrepreneurship and the use of evolving technologies as the engines of growth for rural development. And finally, the 19-member Labor Reform Commission established in 2015 has completed and presented the Reform Agenda Report for the country. Labor and Social Security Minister Shaheeni Robinson says the work of the Commission is crucial for tackling the fundamental problem of unemployment. Especially among youth, while making greater advancements in social protection coverage for all, especially pensioners. It will strengthen the Ministry's mandate for human capital development, empowerment of vulnerable groups in the society, and incorporate more Jamaicans in the development process. Minister Robinson was speaking at an end-of-project ceremony held recently. The labor market reform is aligned to Jamaica's sustainable development goals and is in keeping with the ILO's decent work agenda. The Commission was selected to focus on five key thematic areas, namely education and training, productivity, technology and innovation, labor policies and legislation, social protection and industrial relations, um, to include institutions, customs and practices. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. It's been 11 months. Seven years. 12 years. Since I became the most important person in the world. It's a big responsibility to know that her future is in I hands. I have to tell him and show him that he is my number one. I want to prepare them for life's journey. So as them grow, them know the difference between right and wrong. I got to make sure so I keep him out of bad company. Because if I don't raise him right, the streets are going to raise him. I feel, she feel. If me stumble, him fall. Knowing I'm responsible for their future, and they're responsible for Jamaica's future. So I won't give up or allow her to quit. I got to make sure I'm safe on the street and narrow. Me. I prefer to tell them no now than watch them regret it later. Because to the world, I'm just another person. But to my child, I'm the whole wide world. We are in July, but with how the days are going by so quickly, children will be heading back to school in no time. So don't wait until the last minute to get things done, especially if you're registering your child for the first time. <laughs> So your child is about ready to begin schooling for the first time or is graduating to a higher level school. That means going about the business of getting him or her registered for the academic year ahead. We have some useful information. When thinking about getting your child into a school, the first step must be to research and decide on a school with options for your child. This could be a school that is close to home, offers homework services and extracurricular sporting, cultural and academic activities. Once the preferred school has been chosen, you need to make an appointment with the administrators. Parents and guardians need to attend that meeting, armed with some important, accurate information about their children. This information should be clearly written on the registration form if your child's prospective school uses such a document. For children entering early childhood or primary school, you will also need to have the following documents. Parents will need to have available birth certificate the child passport or the immunization cards and they will be required to visit the school and complete the application form themselves. If they are not available, then the guardian or someone they nominate 
can do so, and, but they must be given written permission. These documents are also required for students entering the secondary system who have gained their placement by way of the examination process. In addition, they will need to take in a medical report, which can either be conducted at a health center or by a private medical practitioner. Parents and guardians will also be asked to provide details of any physical disability or challenges that the child may have. You see, at the outset, we would want to, to identify those factors which can mitigate against their performance in schools. So difficulties with hearing or sight must be addressed. We only want to get an indication that this is the case where we can have proper assessment done so that the effective remedial actions are taken. Now that you have identified a school for your child, talk to the administrators and handed in the required documents along with the registration form, the school will then notify you to say whether or not your child was successfully registered and has gained a place at the institution. So as we guide you through traversing the registration process, remember that registration should ideally begin as early as March to ensure your child gets a space in the school of choice and to give you more time to have them prepared for the new school environment. So don't delay. Get your child registered in school because every child can learn and every child must learn. No son, a verb is an action word. Parents need to become more involved in their children's education. Parents are the first and in many cases the most important teachers. Read with your children, review their schoolwork, visit their school. Tapping and rapping and slapping, I said. Nice, high five. Woo. <laughs> A good education will never decay. The government has been investing in its special education program with the training of teachers. A representative from the Ministry of Education shares with us how deaf students are accommodated in the system. So much has been done by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information to advance learning of deaf students. And with me to talk about these achievements is Education Officer within the Ministry, Christina Addington. Welcome Mrs. Addington. Thanks for having me. Tell me a bit about the different stages of hearing loss and how it affects the ability to learn in the traditional school system. Okay, well, Andrew, hearing loss occurs on a continuum based um, going from hard of hearing to deafness. Um, and on this continuum, there are, very dif there are different levels. So we start off with a mild hearing loss, then you can have a moderate loss, a severe loss, or a profound loss. It's important to note that it is the level of loss being experienced that, by the child that really impacts on if the child is able to be educated in the traditional system or if the child has to be educated in a segregated system. For children who are experience mild hearing losses, for the most part they're able to cope and experience success in the, the regular school system. Um, but for this to happen, there have to be a couple of factors that have to be in place. Um, firstly, the student has to be amplified, fitted with hearing aids. The child has to be in a small school setting, most importantly, in a small class size, so that there is not a lot of background information to distort information being shared between teacher and the students in the classroom environment. Um, Another thing is the teacher working with a child has to ensure that she or he utilizes specific strategies that will help the child maximize whatever residual hearing that the child has. So things like placing the child at the front of the class. Um, the teacher has to also remember he or she cannot turn their backs to the class while teaching. They have to ensure that they always have the child's attention, let them know, let the child know when they're speaking to them. And 
The greatest thing I think also is that the parents have to be very, very involved because once there's great parent involvement um, in the educational life of the child with a mild loss, then this will better ensure success. So Mrs. Addington, how many specialized schools are there for these students? Well, um, to date we have seven special education schools for the deaf across the island in Jamaica. We have three public schools which are operated um, in partnership between the Ministry of Education and the Jamaica Association for the Deaf. These are the Danny Williams School for the Deaf. They are in Kingston in Pope Estate, Papine, and they have two satellites. One, a preschool center which is attached to the school and another unit class at the Excelsior Primary School. The St. Christopher School for the Deaf is also a primary school and that school is in Brownstone, St. Anne, and it has a boarding facility. And Lister Mayor Gilby High School for the Deaf is the high school for the deaf. And that school has two satellites, so they have a satellite in Maypen and they have a satellite in Port Antonio. The other four schools are private schools. Um, they are the Caribbean Christian Center for the Deaf. They operate three schools, one in St. James, one in Manchester, and one in Kingston. And the Jamaica Christian School for the Deaf, and they operate in Leithy, St. James. So how has the ministry been advancing the learning of these students in these particular institutions? Well, the ministry has been playing its part. Um, for the most part, there is greater interaction and greater support to the public schools. Um, one of the things that um, the ministry has done a couple of years ago, through discussions, the special education unit lobbied for posts of teachers' assistants to be established for the schools, special schools, and so the schools for the deaf, all the schools for the deaf, um, public schools, they got teachers' assistants. It's important to note that these teachers' assistants, they're not called teachers' assistants in the schools for the deaf, but they're called deaf culture facilitators. So although their role is to assist in helping the teachers to bring across the concepts. They also have another, which is a more important role, which is they are the deaf models for the children. The children are deaf, they are de deaf, so the children have models and they display the culture, the deaf culture. So then and there, the children are seeing and learning about their culture and learning that it is okay to be deaf. They're deaf and it's a part of life and how they can um, succeed. The ministry also has put in place um, quality education circles and all the schools for the deaf are engaged in a quality education circle. So the principals meet with um, administrators from other schools, they share information and so the principals are able to learn and, and get advice and, and share information. We want to thank Mrs. Christina Addington from the Special Education Unit in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information for sharing with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, until next time, see you around. Informing, educating, entertaining. That's what we do. Keep watching Jamaica Magazine. I can't become the master of my destiny. Step up your stride, make we work like a harder. Do it like Veronica, more than a sofa. We can rise above the challenges and shine. Was with passion in your heart. Make a plan and stop all the hiding. You think I saw? We reach on the edge. Nutritious food, succulent dishes, superior workmanship, and excellent service. Jamaica is on the go. Let's grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Let's harness the indomitable spirit of our most valued resource, our people. Let's support our local businesses. After all, buying Jamaica means building Jamaica. Nugget. Original. 
Normally at this time of year, there would be a winner in the annual festival song competition. Persons would be singing it and looking forward to that big performance during our independence celebration. But the format has changed for this year's Jamaica 55 celebration. There will be a compilation of the best of festival to include songs that were hits but never won the title. We went ahead and did a flashback from the 60s and 70s periods of the competition. Popular festival hits of the 60s and the 70s still being enjoyed today. Although the first festival song competition was in 1966, the process started in 1963 with the creation of Jamaica Festival by then Minister of Development and Welfare, the Most Honorable Edward Siaga. This was to establish an umbrella for the various types of festival events that were happening sporadically. We were independent from 62, and people were having dances each year and various acti activities through the country without any real organized structure to control it in any way. I don't think it was even thought of that it should be like it. that. People are enjoying themselves. We are independent, we are free kind of thing. So, to coordinate a structured independent celebration island-wide, the Jamaica Festival Commission was formed by an Act of Parliament in 1968. This later became the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, JCDC, in 1980, which has since been coordinating all festival activities, including the well-loved festival songs. Sweet Jamaica is now on the move. Help me with my song and let the people them come sing along. That opportunity was really, really welcome. And the public did now see it as something that um, is structural, it's permanent almost. In that case, that you have to go around and lay in there to hear you sing, or you're going to dance and tonight, you might hear a man. On. Here was something which annually, when you talk about festival and John yourself, this was the song which was going to be the flagship for the festival. During the 60s and 70s, Rocksteady was the sound of the day, but as popular and entertaining as it was, like the ska and menta that preceded it, there wasn't much publicity for both the music and artists. So, entering festival for an artist was an opportunity to acquire some ex exposure because we didn't have the amount of um, record producers then that we obviously have now are opportunities for exposure. The Jamaica music was not accepted near to live it is today. So we the stations were not playing the music as they ought to or could have. It is believed that airplay rotation of the festival songs of the 60s and the 70s opened the door for a wide acceptance of our music locally and internationally. And more important, created a profile for the artists. The big thing was the recognition that was priceless, that you won it because Toots was here and Toots won it with Bam Bam. I mean, Toots never looked back after that. The Maytals, with Toots as lead singer, won the festival song competition three times. He and other winners went on to become successful recording artists. The Jamaica Festival Song Competition, during its initial years, got overwhelming support from the people who look forward to the music that would herald independent celebrations. The music was the most potent and likely force to draw people towards it, right? So that's why the accent was played on it. Placed on it. But the people, the people welcomed it because they were, remember again to you, the independent thing, we had the Rastafarian community was still very vibrant in Jamaica. Talking about nationalism, patriotism, Jamaican and anti-imperialism and things like that. This, is, this can be looked at to say, here was another event that are happening now, coming from us, to shake off the shackles of colonialism and even classism and racism and things like that. So it, it, it had various 
you know, it impacted in various ways on many people and the country as a whole. So even it might be not might, might be defined, as I just said, you know, in some books. But these were feelings on the street, you know. This gave me a sense of this is us, this is a we know kind of thing. You know what I mean? So the festival song has been seen as something more than just some words or some lyrics or some instruments together. It meant something to the psyche of the people. That gave the people something to look forward to. Normally from the, from the moment the festival song start, the whole thing start, you know. You are listening, it go right down to the last, you know. Because you want to see who are going to come out on top. Everybody was excited about the song and we were always listening for the um, festival song. And then we tried to learn it so that we could sing it together. Festival is a feel-good time and the music added an electrifying spirit among the people causing a competitive vibe leading up to the announcement of the winning song, which was a big thing. Well, now, man, you know, see, uh, Eric Donaldson and them, man, they was your top star, you know, the car, you know, see, them, man, they are bring it. You understand me? So, you know, say, then, you, you got bet to, you know. So, whether you even win or lose, you know, mind it, you know, because, you know, say, your star is still up on top. Artists eventually became popular household names, but if the name somehow slipped the memory, the song title was just as good. The one when you Uncle Benji, well, at least the lyrics were the man gear, you know. Even if you did sit on a yard really a rose can, you'd have still lock off your fire a little bit and go out and go see what really a go on, what them are going in the street with, don't it? So I say, really go. It was so excited those days. And we didn't have so much things to think about. So in the country parts, we just um, gather together to hear it and who can dance it better from who cannot dance it and so on. We used to do a little empty in a room, I cry. Your mother said, You must wipe it. <laughs> but I said, You're not a foolish girl, or something like that, you know? And the memories continue to flow. All right, my song was sang in Water Bam Bam. Is that my song? Bam Bam, Water Bam Bam. So I say, I love you even now. Let me recap some, um, some festival song. Just then for you the song the place. Sixties, seventies. That period the best. Because reggae was now full blown. Rock said it was on its way out. I see that amalgam on the book it was them. So during that two, those two decades, you see? you're getting the best of both. Do that period here, that the body of music, everlasting. And the music will continue to play for centuries to come, building community spirit, patriotism, and just overall niceness. That's all the time we have for today, but another program comes your way tomorrow. Until then, just click on our website, jis.gov.jm, to stay connected. And while you're online, send us your feedback to Jamaica Magazine at jis.gov.jm or via tweet at JIS News. On behalf of the production crew, I'm Audrey Williams. Take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.